Because see, a natural thing cannot solve a spiritual problem. If you don't know who you are in God and through the Spirit, you will never be satisfied by becoming who you think you need to be in the natural. And most of you know my testimony somewhat. And how many of you know that I, when I got saved, I didn't have to be retooled or anything. What I had to do is, I was like a, I guess you might say a, a fresh washed floor or something. I had been through life, but life had taken on a meaning that meant very little to me. But then when Jesus came into my life, how many of you know I didn't have to also relearn a bunch of things because I didn't grow up in the body of Christ. I didn't grow up in church. So when I first begin to hear teachings like what I want to give you this morning about renewing your mind, I firmly believe that most of our problem begins with a thought. In fact, if I can be even more transparent about that, I, I really believe in my heart that our deep-rooted problems in life come because of how we think. Right, and our thinking controls our actions, really, in the process of life. But I know one thing, though, in my own life. It's not as easy to renew your mind as we just say it with our words. Amen. How many of you know that I, I think even problems in life that are generational we, many times, because we don't deal with them spiritually, we only deal with them naturally, we don't pull the root out. We kind of will, if, if I can say this, we kind of just white coat it. We just kind of paint over it and we act like it isn't there anymore because we don't want to see it. But how many of you know it doesn't make it go away? Right. That when pressure comes and things begin to happen, the old man begins to rise up. And we want to deal with it the way we've always dealt with it. And how many of you know, one man said, true insanity is doing the same thing thinking you're going to get different results. Right. How many of you know that is true insanity? But how many of you know that is not what God wants for our life? God wants us to begin to understand that we have victory in life. In fact, the sad thing is most of the time what's preached from many of our pulpits, and, and I'm not bashing any personal person, but what I am saying is, how many of you know the gospel is victory? Yes. The gospel is overcoming. Yes. The gospel is miracles. Yes. The gospel is worshiping our God unashamedly, without any reservation. And really, the gospel is moving the flesh out of the way and finding out what the Spirit wants in our life. Yes. Because how many of you know you are born again through the Spirit, and it's going to be the spirit that solves the natural problems of our life. And most of us try to deal with them in the flesh, but we forget that we are connected to a higher power. And it isn't just some vivid little thing out here like some people want to say. It is the almighty created power that was given to us by salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. And I say that because I believe that we have victory in every area of our life. But how many of you know, for us to do that, we have to grow up and mature in that. And I believe Romans was probably one of the most, uh, where I want to read to you today, Paul was dealing with the Roman church. This was actually the church at Rome. This was not written to the Roman government. This was written to the church that was founded in Rome. But how many of you know that if you're not careful, irregardless of what society you live in, and what is the philosophy of the government and the people and even the legislative power? If you're not careful, you'll let that same thing come in the front door of the church. Mm -hmm. yes. Things like, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I really do. And, and there'll be a day probably when it's hard. And I know there are young people here. And I love you, but I still believe in marriage between a man and a woman. And it has nothing to do with I hate people. It has to do with what I believe the Bible tells me about the foundation of marriage. 
in fact, it's an amazing thing because the sad part about it is what, we're, what we've done is we're diminishing both groups, male and female. I said at our last men's meeting when I was teaching that marriage is the most powerful thing, really, I believe, in society. Next to salvation in the body of Christ and the church, marriage, the foundation of marriage is more powerful than anybody ever gives a credit. Because what it is, is an equality of all things for the man and the woman. And I know some people won't say that. They feel men are above women. Well, I want to tell you, when God made woman, he said, it's not good that man should live alone, but I will create for him a helpmate, someone to come alongside them. Not walk behind them or even walk in front of them, but walk beside them. And these two shall become one flesh. Now why I'm dealing with this is because I want to show you things in the spiritual realm that don't line up always with the natural realm, but they will as long as we let the Spirit flow. When God, through Jesus Christ His Son, Jesus knew He was going to leave the earth and be crucified and sit down at the right hand of the Father and make intercession for you. He said this, I will not leave you orphans but I will send you another, a comforter. Yeah. Almost the same words he said when he sent woman. And what we don't understand is what happened there. He said, I will make you a helpmate. How many of you know he said the same thing in Genesis? Now do we think the Holy Spirit is a second class citizen? Hello? But he, a society tries to divide in any way he can. He'll either do it through gender, through economic means, the rich and the poor. Let's debate everybody and, and create everything divided. How many of you know, one of the reasons God hates division is because it was the very first sin in heaven. Satan divided one third of the angels from the power of God and really went into rebellion. And that's why God calls rebellion like witchcraft. How many of you know if you study the word there are some things that really are trying to happen today in the natural that can only be fought in the spiritual. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And what spiritual wickedness literally means means thoughts that are twisted. It's where we get the word wicker and it means thoughts that are twisted. How many of you know every thought we have is not all from God? I said every thought we have is not from God. But how many of you know some of them come from a root-seeded generational curses and I believe even the way we were brought up. But Paul tries to deal with this in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 he says, And do not be conformed to this world. Everybody say, the world is trying to conform me. Not God, the world. And we all know that the world, heaven and earth, will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So how many of you know, if we conform anything to a worldly system that we see here, and I know this might sound, if you will, even mysteries to you, but how many of you know that to be conformed to this world means you care more about this world than you care about God? It literally means that you don't realize that you are working in eternity. You are not working only in the here and now, but everything you do. When we lead someone to Jesus, that's an eternal work, not a natural work. When you pray for somebody and they get healed here, they're not only going to be healed here, but they're going to be healed there. When a mind gets renewed, it is not only being renewed here, it is also being renewed in the spiritual realm. Amen. Yet many look for the spiritual realm, but they don't really understand that unless the spirit renews the flesh, you can't take it the other way. And many people want to work it out in their flesh so that it works in the spirit when what we have to do is not look to this world to be conformed to this world, to look at psychology, 
to look at all of these things to solve our problems. We need to be looking toward heaven and the Holy Spirit and draw that into the natural realm and then things really change. Then curses, then generational things, then anger, then those things that have carried around in our life will be broken, but they will start in the spirit and manifest in the flesh. But if you don't understand that, you're always trying to solve your problem by natural means, and natural means never are a final solution. They will only be temporary. This is why fear, and really if I can be even transparent, this is why the fear even of court systems and prisons and things like that don't conform people. And one of the reasons why they don't is because fear never works. You don't serve and change because you're afraid of going to hell. And that's why I say very little about preaching to hell because it, hell isn't your home anyway. Heaven is your home. But what you don't understand, what many of us don't understand or have never came to the reality of is that the power of the Spirit can manifest in the flesh, but it cannot work the other way. Because that which is flesh is flesh and that which is spirit is spirit. But I say this because I believe over the next few weeks, God's going to want to pull some roots out. I think we trim the tree sometime and we do better for a while, but we never pull the root of it. Amen. And until we pull the root of it, it will always establish itself again and take on new life. Amen. And it might even metaphor, it might even change, it might bring forth into our life in a different way or manifest by trying to come into our life. If the enemy finds out he can't get through us from our old man of anger and frustration, how many of you know he'll make sure you have tr money problems? Right. And if you can't come in through money, he'll make sure you have marital problems. Right. And if you can't come in through your marriage, how many of you know your kids will make you pull your hair out? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I know no kids have ever done that. But are you hearing what I'm saying? How many of you know there's a lot of doors into our life, but how many of you know we've got to deal with each door by pulling out the root? And if we'll get to the root... And we will understand the power of the release of God into that root and pull it out. How many of you know you will take on a new life? Because he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. In other words, it's not going to look like a worldly system. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Everybody say, my problem is sitting on the top of my neck. Just tell them that. I mean, literally, our problems begin because we've never learned to renew our thought life in the spirit with spiritual tools. We have learned to try to deal with it in the natural. And how many of you know the natural will not accomplish for very long? I said a moment ago that fear does not work. Why our prisons are full of second offenders and third offenders is because how many of you know that kind of a system does not work? It does not rehabilitate anyone. It creates literally a lifestyle that people become accustomed to so they won't change. In fact, uh, I have a good friend named Casey Treat Rich where, I mean, I first heard about renewing in my mind through him. I know he has a book out called Renewing Your Mind. I think Joyce has a book out called uh, The Battle of the Mind, Battleground of the Mind. How many of you know it's really, and so what I'm going to deal with, I'm going to lay a foundation today, but I'm going to be talking today about renewing your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable but imperfect will of God. Now how many of you know you can't even find the will of God, much less the perfect will of God, without a renewed mind? And we wonder, you know, I grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, and how many of you know that everybody was, why am I here? I need to find myself like you were lost. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you could feel yourself, but in here you were lost. Yeah. Because like, why do I exist? What am I doing here? What's my purpose? How many of you know you didn't find that on drugs? Because we tried, believe me. And that didn't solve our problem. Because, see, a natural thing cannot solve a spiritual problem. If you don't know who you are in God, 
and through the Spirit, you will never be satisfied by becoming who you think you need to be in the natural. Are you getting this this morning? I know this is a little, I'm kind of taking my time, this is more of a teaching than a sermon, but we're going to break down some things over the next few weeks that I literally believe can pull out some roots. There needs to be some things uprooted in our life. And I say this because it comes by the renewing of the mind that I may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now this is what Casey said. Casey at 19 was brought before the judge at, at 19. It was his third time there. And the judge said to him, If you're back in my court again, I'm going to throw you in prison. And Casey said, For about two weeks that worked. But why fear never works is because it's a temporary solution for the moment. It is not long lasting. Because how many of you know the moment you get out of what he said and you begin to do something else, again, you fall right back into that same pattern. So what he did is he changed for about two or three weeks, but he couldn't change. Within a few weeks, he was right back doing the same thing he was doing before. But when he got saved... A year and a half later, he had never touched drugs again. Right. And now he's 50 some years old. God. Why? Because he learned to renew his mind spiritually. He didn't try to change it in the natural. That's right. And so let's break this down. Let's, let's kind of look at two, two really phrases here. There's much going on here. The word transformed, conformed, all those words have power. But let's look at the word renewed. What does being renewed mean in this passage? This is what it says to me. The adjustment of our moral and spiritual vision thinking to the mind of Christ. In other words, he's saying there is going to be, when you're born again, there's supposed to be a shift in your life that brings you to feel differently morally and spiritually than you've ever felt before. Because you're no longer under the guidance of the flesh. You're now under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. And coming through that Jesus has born again, gave us a new life. How many of you know all things are passed away, all things become new? Amen. But if we don't grab a hold of that, how many of you know we can be born again but not recognize what happened to us? We can have great fire insurance, we can not want to sin, but how many of you know it's hard to change who you were? Yes. And why that happens is because we don't take on the mind of Christ. The only way you can renew your mind is not doing it through your mind, but through the mind of Christ. And the only way that you can find how Jesus operated was in the Gospels. And when you're in the Word and you found out that His life, He said, this is not my home. We're like a pilgrim passing through. He said, there are greater things that lie ahead of me than that it lies behind me. He said, though you take the flesh, you can never kill the spirit. Until we begin to recognize the real anointing of what Jesus came to do, we can never renew our minds in a way that God wants us to be overcomers. Because how many of you know, Jesus came into our life that we may have victory. And that in him, all things are possible. But the only way we can do that is to get our eyes off of the world and off of the worldly system and off of the natural things of this world and allow the spirit to move. Now it will flow over into the natural, but we can never break off of us the root of a problem until we deal with it spiritually and not naturally. Amen? Amen. He goes on to say, which is designed... To have a transforming effect upon the person's life. In other words, he's saying this. To adjust your moral and spiritual compass. It's like we all have a compass in life. And when you adjust that, how many of you know then it works true? Has anybody in here ever been lost? You know, I, I love the phones as long as you can get service because I have a couple of compasses on mine and I've been lost out in the woods and how many of you know it's dark out there I've told this story but I got lost one year up hunting 
And I don't even know how I did it. I, I guess I was just wandering to my left. I was on the far outside and we were making this drive across this ridge and I was wandering out there. And the next thing I know it was getting dark and, and I couldn't hear anybody and I'm hollering. How many of you can really holler when you're lost? <laughs> anybody know what I'm talking about in here? And I was, I was hollering at these guys and I couldn't hear anything back. But I knew there was a road in front of us. Well, before I knew it, it was pitch black and I didn't have a flashlight. I didn't have anything. And I'm stumbling around in the woods and I'm trying to, I, I knew there was a road out there and I thought if I can find that road, at least I'll know where I am. Well, I found the road. But I was probably about eight feet off the ground and I took a step and when I did, it was like my mind told me there was nothing under my feet. But how many of you know it was too late? And I found the road, but it wasn't in the way I wanted to find it. And I got up and dusted myself off, but I had found somewhat of a barrier, if you will, or I should say a starting point where I could move. That's what happened to me when I became born again. It wasn't easy. I wasn't smart. I should have got saved long before I did. Amen. But at the age of 27, I found the road. Amen. And it began to do something in my life that I had never been able to accomplish ever. And it was that completely mind-changing, God-serving, devil-chasing, sin-killing, spiritual walk that I started on. Amen. And so... If I'm going to renew my mind then in all areas of my life, it's going to be a journey. But how many of you know I need to start somewhere? Yes. And so as today is your starting point, Philippians 2 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, my mind, my mind. needs to be like Jesus. Now, I don't have time to go through all of this, but, you know, Jesus didn't walk a normal life. He didn't, he wasn't concerned about all the things we get concerned about sometimes. Because he realized he's a pilgrim, he's only walking through this road. I mean, I think sometimes we set up our mind to think we're going to be here forever. And just look at your neighbor and say, I love you. You might be young, but you won't be here forever. So I don't know about you, I don't want to get to the end of my life, find out it's leaned up along the wrong wall. I want to make sure I do the best I can with what God gives me because there's one shot at this. And so with that being said, we have to understand then that we have to take on the mind of Christ. And I'm not going to do a whole teaching on that because that's so in-depth. I mean, I don't know where I'd end up. And maybe down the road I will. But God is really telling me that we need to, to do something different. There's another word in this passage. And I'm only going to define these words for you today. But it's actually the word perfect, which is really a... We, we do a really misjustice with that in the English vocabulary. Because it says here that you being good and accepted do the perfect will of God. Now, let me tell you, wouldn't it have been just as easy for Paul to say, do the will of God? He says that in many places. He doesn't say the perfect will of God. So I look this word up. This word has great meaning because what God is trying to get all of us to is to be grown up. To not act like a child. To have our our spiritual walk to be matured. In fact, look at what, this is what perfection means. Mature, having complete natural growth and development. Working on a lower but established growth rate. How many of you know God doesn't expect you to grow up, but it is time to get off the milk and on the meat? Yeah. How many of you know it is time to, when I was a child, I acted as a child, but when I became a man, I put the childish things away. Amen. How many of you know that what God is really saying to us is we can never renew our mind if we stay immature? If we spiritually do not grow up, and how many of you know we got a society today that doesn't want to grow up? And I mean, what is it really bringing? What is it really doing? It's doing some things in our society, even in the natural realm, that really it's happening also. We have people today that have been in church their whole life, but they're no different than the day they walked in. And I'm not bashing that. Praise God, they come to church. Maybe they'll hear the message. But what God wants us to do is grow up. Just look at your neighbor and say, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. 
I mean, to be grown up means you act like an adult. You don't get upset with things and say, I'm going to take my toys and go home. Hello? Well, let me put it another way. Maybe you get upset at some things and you take your one little toy and go home because you don't probably have many. Because you've thrown them all away or ruined them because of your immaturity. How many of you know that we have to learn to treat our car right, our house right, our wife right, our, our kids right? I mean, it's an amazing thing. People, <laughs> I'm going to say something here that probably is going to blow your mind, but you know, I stopped listening to country music. I used to love country music. In fact, I was kind of a kicker. I was a drugstore cowboy. I had a Stetson hat, beaver hat. I had $200 cowboy boots. I mean, I love pack like I was a cowboy. Because <laughs> that's all I was doing. I didn't own a horse or a horse trailer. But I was a cowboy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, I used to listen to what they call kicker music. and. And, you know, I grew up on that. My mom and dad, you know, Hank Williams and, you know, Conway Twitty and Loretta Lynn and, you know, all. I, mean, I, I loved it. Don't misunderstand me. I mean, it's good music until I really start listening to the lyrics. I mean, they all get better looking at closing time, baby. Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? I mean, don't look at me with those deer in the headlights stuff. I... You know, I mean, you know, find time to leave me, Lucille, you know. What I found is most of that music talked about trucks kicking your dog, cheating on your wife, or your wife cheating on you, or leaving. I mean, no offense, but the music was good, but the lyrics brought nothing but negativity. And we, people say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. Don't kid yourself. That which is in your heart is how you live. And I, I'm not putting down country music. In fact, it's sad because... Play it backwards. I, yeah, play it backwards, exactly. <laughs> what, I, what I'm saying is, if you're going to change your mind, you can't set it up like a worldly system. That's why it's powerful when we worship, when Robert and the worship team sing songs about heaven and victory and overcoming and the blessings of God and Jesus coming into our life and he's our source. Though things happen, greater is he who is in us than he who is in the Lord. How many of you know you need to hear a lot of that? Why? Because it makes you grow up. It makes you mature in your heart and out of the heart we live. But how many of you know God doesn't expect this overnight? Remember, I also said it is saying a growth and development working on a low but stable growth rate. What he's saying, what I'm trying to say to you or get across to you is if you're where you were five years ago and you've been walking with God and you're not somewhere down the road, you are not growing up at all. And maybe that's an insult to some people, but you should be different. You should understand the Spirit better than you ever have. You should know more Scripture. You should be able to speak against the enemy. You should be able to see things that others don't always see, that natural things. I mean, I've grown up quite a bit in, in, the, in the area of wanting my own way. How many of you know I grew up wanting my own way my whole life, and I found, look what that got me. It got me at Jesus' feet, but I brought a lot of baggage with me. So church, if we're going to grow up, we're going to have to understand we can't stay the way we are. I believe learning is a lifelong journey. It's not a conference, a sermon. I believe we should learn and be directed our whole life. And if we can't be, we are not really who God wants us to be. Because one of the first things I'm going to talk about in this series is our willingness to be instructed is the only way we can really grow up. Because a logical man can sit down and discuss things. A child always wants their own way. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor. Yes. And so with that being said, let's, let's kind of break this down. If we're going to grow up and be mature, if we're going to grow up and be developed, if we're going to grow at a pace that we need to, how many of you know the first thing it says in Philippians 3.15, Therefore let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, 
And if anyone thinks otherwise, God will even reveal this to you. In other words, if we're going to learn this, if we're going to understand this, then how many of you know to grow up, we are going to have to say, I'm not satisfied where I am. I want to go forward. Because anything that's stopping you from going forward is literally an obstacle. In fact, it's an amazing thing because many people don't recognize the obstacle, so they keep falling in the same pit. But I want to teach you how to recognize. Uh, I will be transparent with you. I'll talk about me. Um, for years, Sandy and I have always had a fairly good relationship. But how many of you know, sometimes the old man would rise up and I would want my way. Oh. Turn to somebody and say, I find that hard to believe. <laughs> so, just like when I was a kid, if I didn't get my own way, there were consequences. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So our house was kind of in disorder for a while until I finally got over myself. Anybody know what I'm talking about in here? Come on, now don't look at me like that. But I say this because how many of you know now when things come awry and that old man begins to rise up because I'm not where I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, Sandy and I say, the enemy's trying to come in. Yeah. We recognize what's happening, enemy, and we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And how many of you know we hardly ever have a disagreement? And uh, sometimes she doesn't agree with me. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Sorry, guys out there on the TV. That's not true. I mean, I have learned that life is not always getting your own way. Life is growing up that you can maturely talk about what's going on. And when you do that, I want to tell you, things change in your life supernaturally. And the reason is because you understand that many times what's trying to come in is trying to come in through the spirit, not even the natural. Because God joined you in a marriage, in a relationship, in a family, spiritually. He knew me before I was in my mother's womb. He knew where I would be. He knows the beginning from the end. Yet at the same time, I still have to do the process of walking through this life. And if I will do that and do it in a way that lines up with the Word of God, I see things... Ephesians 1 says that the hidden mysteries of God are not hidden from me, they are hidden for me. They're hidden to the world. He says the world cannot know these things, but to you that know Jesus, all things are revealed to you. So when you do this, you have to understand that it comes spiritually. Now, let me kind of bring this to a close this morning. But what happens is most of the time because our mind is not renewed, most of the time because we haven't cut it off at the root, we stop the blessings of God with our mouth, with what we say. I just got done finishing the series about Speak to the Mountain. But think about this. I was, uh, I actually, I've been in business most of my young adult life and how many of you know I've been in the God business ever since, almost 25 years now since I planted the church. And I've learned a lot about business. I've been to college for business. But I listened to something just this last week that literally formulated something in my heart that's changed my entire overview about God's business. And it's a series called Rich Man or Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's a businessman that's became a billionaire and the way his philosophy is is completely different than most business classes I've ever taken. And one of the things that he says is he says, first of all, now not on everything, but if you know something is from God and God wants you to have it and God wants you to bless you, most of the time what comes out of our mouths is this, I can't afford that. And it's always about the money that's in your hand of what you can do. How many of you know I could have never built this church if it was the money in my hand? But he said what happens is it all starts in our mind. Because when we say I can't afford it, we just turn our brain off. And there's no responsibility for us. But when we say what do I have to do 
to accomplish that, now we have to get a plan, we have to think about it a while, we have to turn our brains on, we have to pray in the Spirit, we got to find out what God wants from us. But if we just say, I can't afford it, then we don't have to think about it from there on, and we take no responsibility. Now man, that is completely different in the way we think in life. Because it isn't about putting ourselves in debt, it's about getting a plan to get out of debt. It's about a plan to get things that you know God wants for you, but you're going to have to think about it. You're going to have to dream about it. You're going to have to pray about it. You're going to have to talk about it. You're going to have to engage your mind to get it done. You can't just say, I don't have any responsibility. That's right. That's right. That's some good preaching right there. Yes. Well, this is where we're going to begin because this is how most things in our life transpire. We don't take ownership of it because we say we just can't afford it or I'm not called to do that or God, I know God's laid it on my heart but it just can't happen because I have too many problems solve the problem by saying what do I have to do to get that done because how many of you know that engages your mind yes, it does. if you just turn your mind off to any responsibility how many of you know you will never renew your mind and be mature in God are you out there this morning? Yes, because it is so true in our lives. Listen to me. He, he used this, uh, uh, an illustration. This is a worldly illustration. The man was not a Christian. Anybody know who Ray Kroc is? He's a man that started McDonald's. Well, actually, the McDonald brothers started McDonald's, but he was selling milkshake machines and declared bankruptcy three times in his life and was 51 years old. And he came across these brothers that had started this franchise of fast food hamburgers. And ended up going into business with them and the thing was growing so fast that they wanted out so he bought them out and he was sole proprietor, sole ownership of McDonald's until it went public. But he was speaking one day, multi-billionaire. He was speaking one day at a, a, an Ivy League school, Harvard or Stanford, Yale, one of those schools, and he was speaking to their graduating class. And when he got done speaking, a certain group of students asked him to go to lunch. And he consented and went to lunch with them. And they were all talking and asking him questions. And he, he said, I have a question for you. He said, what business am I in? And everybody just laughed, you know. And he said, no, I'm serious. What business do you think I'm in? And finally, one young man spoke up and said, well, you sell hamburgers. And he said, no, I don't. He said, I'm in the real estate business. He said, my restaurants are on some of the richest property in every community, on major highways, but you see me as a hamburger salesman. He owns more property than any person in America. Because they thought only in their mind they never saw the big picture. That's right. That's right. How many of us try to renew our mind but we're just getting by? I just go to Jubilee. I just am a Christian. No. You serve God that has a cattle on a thousand hills. You serve God that created everything you see. Your Father has made you an inheritance. You're seeing the small picture of just what's going on today. He sees the big picture that's inside you today. But what I got to ask you is do you see the picture? Because until you see the picture, you will only see what's going on today and never renew your mind nor pull the roots of curses that are over your life until you learn to say I take responsibility what do I have to do to make this happen and I guarantee you you don't have to walk through it alone there are hundreds of people probably around you that want to support you and a God that sent the Holy Spirit to walk beside you 
and a good church that will pray for you. Amen. But if you don't recognize that, you can never make it where God really wants you to be. Did you get anything out of that this morning? See, you've got to see the big picture. If you'll see the big picture and stop saying, I can't afford it, and start saying, what do I have to do to make it happen? And I'm not talking, that's only one thing. That's money. What about other things? Well, I'm never going to have a good marriage. You know, it's always been this way. What do I have to do to make it different? That's what I had to do. Well, I don't have all the skills to raise my children, but my God does. What do I have to do to make it different? Speak over your children. I mean, we used to sneak anointed cloths in their pillowcases. What are you going to do to make it different? Or maybe it is finances. Quit saying I can't afford it. If you know God wants you to have it, start saying, what do I have? Are you out there? Yes. Because I want to tell you, this is really renewing your mind. What we're talking about here is where the rubber meets the road. Not some pie in the sky thing. Something that you can do, that you can apply, that you can pull those roots out completely and not be under that curse any longer in the name of Jesus. If you want it, God will help you get it. But you have to do your part. Amen.